Batman. We're talking Batman today. Na 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 And the music that goes along with it. And today I got a very special guest, and he knows a thing or two about music. He is a musician himself. Din from F105. Thanks for joining me. Hey, James. Great to be here. I love this movie. It's yes. my Batman. This is the Batman movie I've always wanted. Did you grow up with Adam West? I did. I've, you know what? I've got to rewatch the movie because I, I just... You know, more and more people rank that movie as actually a really great movie. And I can't remember. So I'm going to rewatch that soon. I love the show. And in 89, I got Batman. I got the Bat Fever that everyone had in 89. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's been my favorite superhero since 89. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I grew up with Adam West. And I love that the Batman. By the way, spoilers for the Batman going forward. So if you haven't seen it, probably pause it and come back. Go for three hours, then come back and watch, and watch this as we talk about it. We dive into it a little bit. But there were a lot, Din, of connections to the Adam West show, which really kind of shocked me when I watched it. And I can't stop talking about it because it made me so happy. They were very subtle mm. nods, I thought. And I think when you listen to Matt Reeves, and you sent me actually an interview with him uh, earlier today, and you listen to Matt Reeves talk, it's like he loves almost every aspect of the character. And I felt like he put little nods to mm. so many variations of Batman in this movie. Mm. Well, the the main thing, the the important one was the Shakespeare yeah. uh, statue, and I think in Wayne in the Wayne built house, Tower, and, yeah. I, and then that was the the telephone that got that was the thing that got in the Bat Cave, wasn't it? In the that was, show, the yeah, it was the Shakespeare head was the to get into the Bat Cave, and then the telephone reminded me of Commissioner Gordon's red phone. Right, 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 right. And it but was the funny, cool thing about the Shakespeare thing is that re you know this is a. Batman is a Shakespearean character in this too. Yes, that's he's sort true. of like a tragic. This is not a person who's mentally all there, and nor should he be. I, I love this take. It's like if you're gonna become Batman, you're not. You're not all there. And I think that's one thing that's gonna be divisive is the take of Bruce Wayne slash Batman in this film, where he's mm. not the playboy Bruce Wayne that we that we've grown up with that we've seen all the time. He's not a mm. debonair, right? He's kind of like. Like, I'm very emotional. I don't like who I am. Stop talking to me. Don't look at me. Get away from me. And I kind of understood that because I think if if you were born, not that I would know, but if you were born a billionaire and, a, and your parents were in the limelight and then a horrific crime occurred, you would be pushed into, that, into the spotlight as well. And that's probably not where you want to be, especially mm. when you're a little kid. So I can see him kind of growing in that way. And of course, the one person who's raising him is Alfred, who was an ex-British intelligence officer. So that's not somebody who's going to be all fluffy with you either. That would create kind of the playboy persona, which he needs Bruce to be and he wants Bruce to be. And I think going forward, we're going to get a little bit of, more of that based on the ending of this film. Well, what I like about that and the whole nature of this film in general is that it gives you, it asks why about everything. It doesn't just say uh, Bruce is a playboy because that's how we've known him in the past. So just accept it. It actually yeah. sets up a why, which is going to make you want to watch a whole trilogy or even more films about this because Bruce isn't actually a, a playboy because in, in, in a lot of iterations of Batman – since you know the dark knight returns frank miller's comic reestablished him in the 80s he just really is not the playboy that's just an act so the real bruce is not that guy so what this sets up is that maybe he hasn't gone through the process yet to come to that act to fool people because <laughs> he might in a future film be like you know what moody me is too much like moody batman and i've got to like start changing my public personality to throw people off so that's and I, I think he is learning that i think towards the end of the movie i really like the just juxtaposition um where i am the shadows at the beginning of the movie then at the end he is the light that guides yes. gotham and that's, just like, that's actually why i love this movie is that um you know my fundamental belief in life the universe and everything is that there is no light without the dark you don't have the choice to choose the light unless you've, if, unless you, you know, there's no sun without the deep of space. It's just actually right. the way things are. So for Batman to go through an arc of this darkness that is appropriate, given everything you said about what happened to him as, as a kid and his, his upbringing, um, then, then uh, the arc to, to find the light in that darkness is what makes this movie really touch my heart. 
uh, and more than any Batman movie, maybe even comic ever has. Let's get into the music now, because I think you're right, but we got to get into this music because that's what we, we're going to talk a lot about that. That's going to bring us into these discussions. Well, it's, in, it's in the music, too. Yes. Absolutely. It's in the water so, tower music scene, right? It's the whole soundtrack is dark. And then you start to get the beams of light in the music of the water tower track. Let's kick it off with some Ave Maria, though. They re- really. A- Ave Maria. Yeah, because there's a difference. There's one note there, difference between the uh, the Schubert's and then how how uh, how Giacchino did a postmodern uh, score using a take on this. Yeah, I thought it when I first listened to this soundtrack, which was a week before I saw the movie. I thought, why? What is with Ave Maria? It's very heavily implanted in the riddler's theme and then in the movie mm-hmm. obviously the riddler th- sings it so we're, yeah talk to me a little bit about the change and how that plays out with the rid- the character mm-hmm. of the I'll riddler. sing it for you so yeah. um uh, i'll do a falsetto because i'm not going to belt out the high tenors of the kids voices now uh it's the uh the it's it's a it's it's a six note total phrase uh but on the fourth note where it goes to a major third uh, for people that don't know music, it just major means happy sounding note. Uh, instead, on that fourth, it goes to a minor, which for people that don't know, just means basically kind of a sad sounding note. So it goes, instead of, um, it goes, on the fourth, and that's the minor note that sounds unsettling, you know, and sad. Mm-hmm. Instead of instead of Schubert's, which is more uplifting. Yeah. So instead like of, is that ah, it's ah, that's <laughs> I, feel the I wish I had one, yeah, there one is, is a, there, and one is ha- happier, you know. And one obviously is playing into the villainous the villainous games of the Riddler and how he plays and how he is more of a like you said a darker sadder character he has mm-hmm. on the, the downswing yeah well it's you know i say that this is michael giacchino's best star wars soundtrack because <laughs> it's everything sort of that williams did which is what wagner did you know with the light motifs and um telling people what george wanted which was to tell people the story through sound and visual without even to need dialogue so I, you know, when you asked me to do this, I went and researched it more. So right at in the first scene, when when you get the Riddler's breathing, because you know it's the bad guy, because he's stalking yeah. someone and he's breathing. Absolutely, yeah. It's like very Vader-ish too, breathing. Now that you think about it, so he's um, you get the Ave Maria, but on that fourth note, it goes to the the more the the more uncomfortable minor note, and it's a youth choir. So it's the London's something youth choir. Who actually later appear in the movie when this, this mm-hmm. song's used again to uh, the second time out of three, I think. But it's uh, so what happens is it's telling you right away without you knowing. You're getting the message. G. Kano's doing a John Williams thing, which is the Riddler's problem started when he was a kid, and something went wrong. And now the Ave, Ave Maria that everyone knows, but can't maybe most people can't even say what the name of it is. We feel something's wrong because of that darker fourth note. So, you know, all the, I didn't think of this when I saw the film. I just felt <laughs> like But it's subconsciously else. in there. Yeah. yeah, like, so they're telling the story subconscious. And I'm sure somewhere in most people's subconscious, they're going, something's off. They don't know why, but the story, the music is telling you the story. That's what, you, it's a great intro to the film. You don't need any dialogue or anything. The visual and the music is telling the whole thing. It's so Star Wars. Yeah. I never even thought of that comparison before. Let's get further into the, the well, music Giacchino's, now. That's what he's been studying mostly, right? So yeah. he's using everything he's learned. That's what he loves, Star Wars. So Yeah, and he definitely more and you know, Rogue One, you can love the soundtrack or not. He only had, I think it was four weeks to write that thing, right, which true. is which remar- it's remar it's remark it's remarkable how yeah. It's remarkable. Like in four He's weeks, a remarkable genius. So it just makes yeah. musicians like me want to quit when I hear what he does. But. 
but yeah, four weeks regardless is a remarkable, remarkable amount of time. Catwoman's theme is one that you stuck out to me. As soon as I heard it, I was like, oh, I could feel the sadness, the despair. It's very sultry. It's it, and it, it's very much embedded in that film noir, which this movie is. Yeah, it's uh, so the Catwoman's theme. I, what I liked about it the first time, I I mean, I can't wait to see the movie again, but when, when I would repeatedly hear it sort of, the first time I heard it in the film and then repeatedly was just how romantic it kind of mm, did the job. Very. It was like, I was like, this is, this is across the stars level good. It's making me, it's, the music is making me, uh, it's working my heartstrings. It's making me feel the, uh, the chemistry and the romance between these characters. So it's doing its job. It's a beautiful theme. I haven't studied yet studied it yet but i i do recognize that it starts with like a kind of a showroom kind of um where i made a note just let me check check my note here um, oh yeah it's a it's a it's sort of like a uh, lounge piano yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. that's what it said in the article that I was reading about. That's how they defined it. So, because she's working in the the criminal club, so it's like the lounge club kind Very of, and it goes club. goes from like. The, so this is something that's used throughout the the soundtrack. Things start on piano and then they grow into symphony. So for her, it starts on lounge piano and then it grows into the romantic across the stars kind of symphony that's going on. Yeah, her theme was great. And then, of course, there's the, the Batman theme itself, the first one that they released, but the Batman theme, which plays throughout. And let's mm. talk about that, but also that blending in with Nirvana underneath. Like, they, they have, like, this beautiful marriage yeah. together. So something I'm going to say here is, uh, so the definition of postmodern art, it started in visual art, and uh, there was a technique. And the technique was that you use you used two or more iconic works of art from the past and you reference them in your work of art. And this started to happen when you can use like ready-made images. You could pull out a, you could say rip a page of a Picasso artwork from a book and glue it on the canvas and then, you know, draw a part from maybe a Michelangelo painting on your canvas and then draw your own thing in there. And you mesh, so you mesh two or more iconic historical artworks with yours and you come to a new meaning. So I would define Giochino's soundtrack here as a, as a, as a quintessential uh, postmodern work of art to use past pieces of music, iconic pieces of music intermixed with his own creative and inventive pieces of music with this film to re-evaluate the older iconic pieces into new meaning, new meaning for our time. So he uses um, the Schubert's Ave Maria. We have Kurt Cobain's Something in the Way. Uh, and that comes from Matt Reeves. I'll get to that in a second. And uh, let's just, there's more. There's a Beethoven piece that he intermixes at some point. There's a, there's a famous funer funeral piece by, I can't say the artist's name, by Foray or something like that, F-A-U-R-E, in the past. That's the, the piece that's happening when he's going to, he thinks Alfred's going to die, you know? And all the sound cuts out, and you just hear this funeral piece, which is telling you death. So uh, what's going on is a postmodern reinterpretation of these iconic themes. And uh, the something in the way theme comes from Matt Reeves, who was talking about how he, to Pattinson that, your Batman is actually looks is influenced by Kurt Cobain. And he didn't actually get to why in the interview, they kind of went off into different directions. And then I thought about it was it makes perfect sense. Kurt Cobain and Bruce Wayne both had traumatic childhoods. And uh, as Matt Reeve was saying, Batman is not really a choice. It's sort of a compulsion in his only way to deal with the trauma and work out the world. It's less, it's more about that than it is about doing good for people. That's why he's on this vengeance thing. It's more of just like he, Kurt Cobain needed rock and roll in an arguably an unhealthy way. And uh, so did, and just like Bruce needs Batman. So you mix that with uh, the Ave Maria of the childhood. And now that's reinterpreted with the dark note of the children's choir. 
and you have the story being told musically from these two iconic historical pieces, which I can't, I'm getting old, Kurt Cobain is historical, oh my god. <laughs> uh, I saw them play Maple Leaf Gardens like a month before he passed. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, so you have something in the way and Avi Maria talking to each other about broken childhood and, and what that turns you into as a, as a, as a young man, Kurt Cobain and Bruce Wayne. Yeah. So ah. no, mostly we'd probably, you know, like the skirt and the hair of Heath Ledger, it's sort of like reinterpreting, you know, Heath Ledger was the Kurt Cobain figure as the Joker yeah. in, in the dark Knight. but here Batman makes it makes sense that's how he's like the joker actually and that actually sets up well that'd be cool for the future <laughs> they, they have that you know shared the shit they yeah. share Kurt Cobain or something that was sure thing that's what you know i what never that make perfect sense it's like a pretty yeah. perfect masterful but on reeves and Giacchino's part of postmodern work of art this batman movie to re and post postmodernism was about recontextualizing po, like after postmodern like less Post postmodern is more of an emphasis on creating meaning, which goes back to believing in those old things, like faith, but in a new way. So, this is a post postmodern work that leads you to the light and the faith uh, uh, in in something more that Bat Batman and Bruce find at the end of the movie. To the light, enlightenment. To the light. I never put. And I obviously I never put those two tracks together into one combination. And I was and, trained. Yeah, exactly. That's why OCAD. we're talking. <laughs> yeah, I was trained at OCAD in a, like in, in a post post postmodern era, right? So yeah, and that's why you know the music, and I have no idea. I just watch. I'm like, that looks great and sounds beautiful. That's <laughs> that's, that's how I go. Well, you know, filmmaking. No. I know visual art more probably than music, but I visual art help. I think. A lot of movements happen first in visual art because it has a smaller audience now than, than music. Mm. So that's, that's true. The music in this film is is quite incredible. It keeps keeps you on your toes. Plays very well. What other are there any other pieces? I know there is one that stick out to you as this is the best one, or in your opinion, your favorite one, and why? Well, so. I do love, I just want to say that um, one of the other historical pieces that two more that he's using are the main theme, um, which is dum, 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 which is the Imperial March, dum, yes. dum, 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 which is a complete ripoff, even as it progresses, of, of uh, Mozart's Funeral March. So, and Mozart's funeral march is originally on piano. So this takes, a, so Giacchino is now referencing two more iconic historical pieces of the Imperial March and Mozart's funeral. And he's saying something about Batman. He's being a little empirical. He's being tyrannical. He's taking the law into his own hands. There's no due process. He's, um, he could be a future tyrant based on that kind of mentality, <laughs> uh, which comes from his brokenness. He's not thinking like it's a, you know, and uh, and uh, also funeral. You know, there's a lot of foreshadowing. A lot of even Catwoman says you're going to die one day if you stay here. So, yeah, it's very people. People walk away from this movie and they say it's very dark and depressing. And I say I don't know. I think it it it. it I think it wants to be that. It, it, hmm. Batman feels like he wants to be that, but I think the movie actually is more, especially the way hmm. it ends, it's more optimistic. It's about finding the light. It's about coming hmm. from the darkness into the light, like you said. And I think the music cues all play into that, where it's like, it tricks you into thinking that the movie hmm. is is this emotion when really it's it's getting to this. It is all about finding finding happiness, finding hope, and, and or, finding or, the light at the end of the or yeah, hap maybe not happiness. I can't see, ever see Bruce. Not necessarily happening. Happy. Yeah, but it would be good because there's a comic where he ends up with Selena Kyle, and they're sort of happy in their older age. Like I'd like to see that ten movies down the road or something. But uh, but um, he's uh, it's it's more he finds it's uh, it's just about the internal. So the reason why I like this Batman more than any is one the fundamental thing about batman is his internal struggle struggle right whether it's the animated series or most of the comics since the 80s it's like he's not just going to kill indiscriminately without thinking about it 
if he does, he's going to go through, it's going to be traumatic and he's going, going to go through a huge, huge internal struggle. Part of his character, as we know it, is that he will never kill. And it's always a struggle because if you're out there defending people who, and, and they're the victims of the most horrible crimes imaginable, of course, you're going to want to kill. Yeah. This is something that even Gandhi said. Like, it's just going to be a natural thing that you're going to go through. So Batman is about that struggle. So that's why I didn't like Batman versus Superman, because there was no struggle where he got to saying, I'm going to kill unilaterally and, and preemptively kill Superman. There was no, like, I just was like, I can't get on board for that because to me, Batman's the struggle. Maybe he gets to that, but <laughs> maybe, but there would be more turmoil for him for a long period of time to get there. So this movie does that, I think. And through all that struggle, through all that darkness, we get to the, the water. The water seems great because it works metaphorically on so many levels, right? It's like the water is free uh, in a way. And Bruce like and Batman clip. start to get free of their old... Like, I love the fact that he says no guns to Gordon yeah. at one point. And Gordon's like, okay, that's okay for you, buddy. But <laughs> Yeah, we, we need <laughs> that. Yeah, and, uh, and then at the end, you know, he's uh, he's 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 like, why? I can't remember. Like, they ask like one of the Riddler cronies, like, why? And he's like, I am vengeance. Who are you? And he says, I am vengeance, because he that was someone Bruce formally beat up out of vengeance. This is great. That's actually what happens with violence in the world. It's a cycle. Yeah, I think so that gets he lots realizes, of too. He realizes he has to break that cycle. So it's like. The Batman that goes, this is movie is so great because it's saying why. Why does he get to that place where he needs to have a different take on violence? Why does he not kill? It's now a part of his soul. And we're seeing, instead of just saying, this is the way it is, we're seeing why. Yeah, that's something that I find. I'm not going to bring them up, but there's some movies that they have made in recent years where the why is never asked. There's never a why. It's always because. There's always just a because, not a why. And you like to see that. Like, give us the story of why. And that's usually what makes the most compelling films. I find, I like what you said about the water. It's like the baptism, right? Like, Gotham is now reborn. Yeah. It's washed away. All the cleansing of all, all the sins of Gotham now. That's the for the Riddler, but not so much. Batman now moves on. Who knows what the sequel is going to bring? Hopefully we get a sequel. Matt Reeves oh, getting on it right now. I know I mean, we were the pet. <laughs> it's doing good money. So can you imagine if there's like, nah, it's a one-off. Goodbye. Anyway, <laughs> they're like, reboot, reboot it again. They got Tom Holland in to play Batman because that would probably be what happens. Um, the symbolism you is so Joseph Campbell. Like this, you know, the people that make these movies now are really like they know what they're doing in terms of their mythological blueprint. Mm -hmm. And this is like Joseph Campbell always says, you know what happens to the hero is always that they come back to show their com community, whether it's local, national, global, intergalactic, that they're one. And, um, and that all also that the two worlds become one, whatever the real world is and whatever the heavenly world is. So this, the arc here is that Batman, the water, we're literally 90% water, right? So everyone's in the water and then Batman gets out of his ego and this thing that he's doing just because he's broken and not really to do good in the world. It's more about vengeance and, and a compulsion of, to, from his pain. Now the water comes and he's free of that. And he sees others around him and he's like, I just want to help people in the moment. So the, the climax is just him helping people out of the water. It's so... So, so I love that it was People so don't small. like that because that's boring, but I love it because it's poetic. He's yeah, saying, well, that's what well, I love. I'm I'm one with people now, and I'm going, and I care about them, not just yeah. me. I thought it was a great ending, and I, you know, I, I thank goodness there were no sky beams shooting down on top of Gotham at the end, which is, you know, every superhero movie for the last five years had a giant sky beam. Like, oh, I loved how small it was. It was like the joke. It was it, this movie, you know, is more. You can compare more to like the Joker than you can to Spider-Man. And that's what I love about it. It's like, this is an isolated movie that takes place in Gotham. That is about these real people. And it's not, I mean, it gets over the top, but it's never unrealistically over the top. I mean, maybe, you know, I don't know if a city would ever be submerged underwater the way that this was in that respect. But other than that, I mean, I, I love this movie. I thought it was great. I love the simplicity of that ending, but how it's a simplest, sim, simple ending 
but a complicated product that we got from it. It was like all of everything came together at a head. It was like this film just felt from beginning to end like it was meticulously thought out and planned, and they knew every step along the way. And the one thing that I've said before on this on these shows is that you know the the Batman is super smart. But the Riddler has to be one step ahead of the Batman, but the script has to be a step ahead of the Riddler, right? Like, because you can't, yeah. they, the Riddler yeah. can't have a riddle, then they're like, well, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. And, and we've we've seen that in movies before where they've thrown a curveball at us and they're like, you can tell they don't have a solution for it. And it's just like, ah, magic. But this one is like, you know, they always were felt like they were a step ahead and we never felt cheapened. Like, n- nothing the Riddler did or Batman did or Gordon or anybody felt the result of what they did was cheap i never felt no either did i either did i i mean i felt like i mean i just got what i was hoping for in terms of its essence and that it was going to be soulful and internal because <laughs> that's what blew me away about matt reeves work with the apes is that yes. this character had the most compelling internal world going on in him about his struggle with nonviolence too you know, because given the right circumstances, people are going to be violent and are going to want to kill. <laughs> you know, if you see people around you that you love dying and your only way to save them, like you're just everyone has violence in them. So the fact that I just knew Matt, I just, just like I have faith in this Matt Reeves guy because of what he did with Caesar. And I wasn't disappointed. I got totally what I want. Those I was, movies are fantastic. What was I going to say about, oh, I can't remember. I think you were going to ask me what was, what other piece of music did you like? And I, I couldn't really think. Yeah. The we water can tower. About, I like yeah, the, the water, water tower, 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 yeah. tower track for, for that. About how it just seemed to be a perfect little comp. Oh, my favorite. No, wait, wait. My favorite is the Sonata in Darkness. Yeah. So no I mean, lies. that sounds like a moody Chopin piano piece at its best. Like, I think that's Michael Giacchino's masterwork piece, Sonata in Darkness. And then how that moves, it's the track before Water Tower and how that moves into the light of the Water Tower stuff. It's really great. Yeah, when I listen to this soundtrack, everything kind of evolves into the next. They're not like isolated tracks. It all has this nice flow to it. And you feel like you feel like when you listen to the soundtrack that it is telling you this story. And I really appreciate that. Before you leave, Dan, before we say goodbye, let's talk about some of the similarities that this might have to another movie that's behind your shoulder, The Last Jedi. And because we talk about how this might be I might this might divide fans in a few ways, and we did mention the ending, how it's not an over the top action Marvel mo- ending, uh, which is great for the Marvel films. I'm not taking anything away from those. They, they have but sometimes their, everyone... Marvel gets out of the box, like the Doctor Strange ending. Yes, hopefully, maybe we could talk about that one day. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. But let's talk about the comparisons that you have with the Last Jedi. Well, I think I think one is obvious. An obvious homage um, would be, you know, if is. Um, like Last Jedi is another post postmodern work that references like this is this is pretty deep, but it's I mean I'm 100 percent certain about this. Certain, I'm positive. These are, these yeah. filmmakers are smart and they know what they're doing. Last Jedi is also a post postmodern work of art. It literally references at least two historical movies: it, Rashomon and Empire Strikes Back, and probably more and recontextualizes those two movies into The Last Jedi. All that Luke's pers- the perspectives on what Luke did, that's Rashomon, and then the entire movie is basically Empire Strikes Back. And the whole point is not to rip off either of those two movies, but to use two historical iconic movies and recontextualize it for new meaning. Uh, it's the definition of postmodern art. And um, so I think if you're Reeves and a lot of filmmakers these days, if they're looking at seriously going, how do I reinvent new meeting, new meaning and a new movie uh, and a new blockbuster for modern audiences, you're looking at The Last Jedi because it, it did do that. It successfully did that. You may not like it, um, but it is a fact that it did that and it made good money doing that too. And um like in fact, by fact, I mean generally critically acclaimed, and it performed as much or better than they wanted it to economically. So it worked. And um, I think if you're a director like Matt Reeves, who has to reinvent Batman to make it relevant for now, you look 
to movies like that specifically. And there's a piece of dialogue that tells you it is. Not only is this a postmodern work like Last Jedi, but there's the piece of dialogue that says in, in a moment of weakness. Alfred says about Wayne, the yeah. Thomas Wayne, in a moment of weakness, he made this decision and he wasn't a bad person, but in a moment of weakness, he made a bad person decision. And then he tried to correct it, but he couldn't. And it's so Luke. It's just like exactly, you know. And then just the out, the, then just some pieces of dialogue were to just outright like let's just let's just go for it like white privileged a holes. <laughs> it's just so like that's what was happening with you know. That's what that was what was happening in the Last Jedi. Yeah, I, I saw comparisons too with the Last Jedi, and um, I, yeah, I, I agree with what you said. I think the one thing people look at the Last Jedi, as I say all the time, is like it's it's Empire Strikes Back in reverse, but it has you have to go back to to what you're doing to tell to tell these new modern stories. It's just it's the same argument that happened with with art, where people would in the art world would look at a, a new painter like. Picasso or someone referencing older historical works, two or more in his work, or American Expressionists after that, or a whole bunch, you know, conceptual artists especially, that's where it really came in fullness, conceptual art of the 70s and 80s, with art installations that reference historical works, two or more. It's just, that's just become one of the ways that, it, and it actually is tied to Enlightenment thinking when, you know, in like, uh, in France and Europe, after the Renaissance, when they went through the Enlightenment period, the Enlightenment period was about abandoning the old religions and political ideas of higher of royalty and all that, and trying to find something new that worked, a new way to enlightenment, spiritually and politically. And so the art and the music had to look at the old ways through art and try to come up with where can we go that's new, what might work better for our time. So. That's why art does this. It's not just to rip off old artworks. It's actually we're, we're trying to find a new way to enlightenment because the old ways started to not work. And we're in so like the this old story. Batman started to not work. And now we're or in the yeah. old Luke, depending on your perspective. So how do we recon recontextualize that to make it work for now? And we're in a weird time for movies where we've never been here before, where we, you know, f films have been around for over 100 years. We've never seen something like this before where there's reboots on top of reboots and remakes on top of remakes and black and white went to color and this and that. Like we are in this new era now where almost everything's been done. And you know, there's so much has been done mm -hmm. that you have to go back and you have to figure out new ways to tell stories again. Because, you know, in the, in the 70s, Taxi Driver wasn't a movie, but now Taxi Driver is a movie. You know, in the 90s, Pulp Fiction wasn't, now Pulp Fiction is a movie, which was kind of Taxi. Like, yeah, it's, like the Joker is Taxi Driver. Exactly. You know? It's Taxi Driver, King of Exactly. It's like, but we're at that point now where you have to find a new way of telling these stories. And I like what you just said about mix, you know, find a couple of them, put them together and, and do it. Just like the music was in this. And I thought the music was great. Uh, we're going to wrap it up right now. Dan, anything else you want to say? Anywhere they can find you, listen to some of your jams? Oh, yeah. So uh, f105music.com. And uh, that's basically all the links you're going to find there to Spotify or Apple Music or YouTube or live updates. And uh, if whatever social network you're on, you can just go at F105 music, except for TikTok. I have a TikTok, but I try to put <laughs> my v music videos up and they, they stop me from doing it based on copyright infringement because the label owns the mu music and we can't get that straight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Even though we've been emailing back and forth, like I just like to be able to post my own music. Thanks, TikTok. But they, uh, nope. Nope. You could dance like an, I could go on there and dance like an idiot to someone else's music. And, but not your own. Put my own music. It's such a weird world yeah. we live in. But check them out. Check out the music. Always great stuff going on. You're performing live everywhere. The world is opening up again. So hopefully you can get back on tour and people can go see you uh, perform and do what you love. Thanks so much for joining me and having this. This was a great conversation. Thanks so much. This was awesome. Can't oh, wait to I do it mention, again. Yeah, I'm in the Toronto area. I'm doing a panel on the hero's journey in songwriting, and it's called The DIY Hero's Journey Turning Your Fandom into Creation, and how it worked for me with my songwriting, and how it could work for you in whatever creative thing you're doing, especially in fandom. The, the hero's journey is to inspire everyone on their path. So, we're doing a panel 
Uh, we started it at Force Fest, the Innovative Force Online Force Fest Fan Run in yeah. 2020, and now uh, I've done it at some music festivals or one, and now we're doing it at uh, Comic Con on Friday, Toronto Comic Con, Friday March 18th at 3 p.m. DIY Heroes Journey, and it will have uh, it will have uh, music performances by F105. Oh, sweet. You got to go check that out. If you're in the Toronto area, the greater Toronto area, anywhere around there, make your way down. It's always fun. It's always nice to listen to your music. You have great stuff. But thanks so much for watching, everybody. Give us a like, give us a subscribe. And until next time, may you be the master of your own universe.